ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's meeting. My name is David Zerman, and somehow I've just been re-elected the 71st president of the Royal Society of Victoria for another two years at our... <laughs> at our... At, at our 162nd annual general meeting, which finished at about 15, about 16 minutes past six, later than anticipated, which is why I am starting this four minutes late. My apologies to our guest speaker. We are gathered on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation, and I wish to pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Our talk tonight features Professor Murat Yusel, who has a PhD combined with specialist clinical training in clinical neuropsychology. He is an NHMRC Principal Research Fellow, the David Winston Turner Chair in Addiction and Mental Health, and he currently leads the Addiction and Mental Health Research Program within the Monash Institute of Cognitive and Clinical Neurosciences. Before, you can read all about him in our newsletters if you haven't already, but you can, yeah, and you'll find out a little bit more. But... Come on, Murat, let's come and let's have a bit of a chat. I always say that I like having these chats because fundamentally I'm inquisitive and a busybody. I just like to know more about those who are presenting to us. So can I ask you, first of all, where did you go to school and university? I went to Beaumaris High to start with, which then ended up joining with Hyatt and Sandringham becoming Sandringham College. Yeah. So, And was it... When you were at, say, primary school or secondary school, did you develop any particular interest in science? A dislike. A dislike. <laughs> oh, well, out of here, young man, out of here. <laughs> okay, now you can say it. So, you had a dislike. How did that change? Uh, when I finished Year 12, um, I didn't get the, the score that I was after because I wanted to do physiotherapy. And the year, uh, we, were, we were the guinea pigs of the transition from HSC to VCE, which some of you might remember. Uh, so about a group of eight of us didn't have much to do. So we thought we'll go back to year 12, do year 12 again and try and get a good score without being punished because we were, you didn't get the 10% punishment. Anyway, I did year 12 and then of all my choices, I tried to do physiotherapy, but I put in this last choice called psychophysiology just because I... I'd run out of things I wanted to do and ended up getting into that one, which ended up being science, which I didn't like for a long time until in my third year, um, an external person came along who'd been doing science in dementia and all the amazing sort of neuroscience work that he was doing. And my ears sort of pricked up at the amazing stuff that he was doing. So I followed him and said, I basically want to do what you're doing. What do I have to do? And then he said, well, you've got to do... Uh, another three, four years, and then you've got to do a PhD, and you've got to do this. And so he ended up being my supervisor, and I just did all that. And where did you go? Where did you study? I, I studied, I was enrolled at La Trobe, but I did a lot of my work through Melbourne University. And was there, besides that being what I'll call an aha moment, was there anyone else or anything else that made you focus on the work that you're doing now? I guess... Um, the, the curiosity started with trying to understand the link between brain and behaviour because sometimes there are some really, you know, behaviour can look strange and then trying to understand that and relate that to the brain I just found fascinating. But as time went on and I got more and more involved in mental health, I saw that in the area of addiction and, uh, and sort of compulsive behaviour, they're really, it's such an important problem and you see it everywhere and I just felt like maybe science can really actually have a contribution here. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, Murat will be presenting Gamble, Drink, Consume, Repeat, Why We Need Brain Park. Ladies and gentlemen, Murat. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. And it's a real pleasure to talk to you all. And thank you for showing interest, because as a scientist who's been doing work, for 20 years in the lab, it, it is nice to get what we're doing out there and um, more and more we are trying to do work that, that is translational and impactful and, and what I'd like to talk to you about today is, is really a, an idea, a concept that 
I, we have had for many, many years. And it was uh, when I moved across to Monash University after working at Melbourne for about 16 years, I was in a fortunate position to, to be at the receiving end of a generous donation that really believed in the kind of work that we were doing. And off the back of that, we, we were able to establish um, Brain Park, which is what I'm going to talk to you about, and really tell you about what, why we built Brain Park. And just you know, to give you the sort of the headline, it, is to really come at addictions and compulsions from a, a fresh perspective where we look at the, the diagnostics differently, we look at the treatment differently, and we try to give a new experience and sort of change, give people another alternative option. And today what I'm really going to be talking to you about is some of the, um, the approaches that we're taking and some of the drivers of why we're taking that approach and then give you some snapshots of the kind of early studies that we, we, uh, we're starting to do. Because we're only six months old. We, uh, the building was built uh, six months ago, so we're still sort of in our nappies and learning. Um, but I think there's some really exciting stuff to talk about. When I first started the the curiosity and looking at the brain and it, it it was started in the context of looking at people with psychosis and schizophrenia and whenever we found something on the brain scans that was different to people who didn't have schizophrenia we we automatically assumed that was that they'd had that for the entirety of their life um, and so as time progressed and the years went on then we started to see actually with things that have happened in the last 10 years or five years, there seems to be these brain correlates all the way through to then weeks. Um, you know, someone's feeling anxiety or depression over several weeks that we'd start to see brain correlates and, and some of them were anatomical. And about that time, there, there was a famous study that was the London taxi drivers where, where they showed that, you know, with learning the streets of London, you, your hippocampus changed dramatically, and then there was another study that looked at juggling, people who would take on juggling for a week and then stop, and the brain would change in certain areas for a week and then revert back. So it became this very fascinating area of, well, it's so much, you know, there's so much hope for change to occur in the brain that we never thought was possible just 15 years ago. That was one part of the frustration, but as in the curiosity and knowledge, but then not being able to apply it in some way. So when we think of addiction, I think a lot of people tend to uh, immediately go to alcohol and drugs, which is sort of the more, the, the ones that have been around for a long time and the ones that we sort of immediately think about. And when we think about the prevalence rates of those conditions, we might see them uh, about 4 to 4% 4 for alcohol and 5% for drugs combined at the really the dependence disorder level. So about one in 10 of us might be suffering from one of those problems quite, quite significantly. But if we broaden the sort of the horizon and think about gamble, drink, consume and all the behaviors that goes around them, not just substances, but behaviors all the way through to compulsions, the, the net is quite wide and the kind of things we could be talking about get quite expansive and we're not quite sure even where the boundaries are between some of these things being a, a habit to an excessive habit to an addiction and, and we're still trying to work all of those out. But if we start to look at those behavioural addictions and substance addictions and we add the prevalence rates that's going on in society, you know, 2% for gambling, another 2% for eating and, um, and 2% for OCD, individually they're not necessarily big numbers but when you collectively add them up, all those 1%ers, 2%ers end up being quite a significant amount, maybe 20 to 25% of the population, and many of them also co-occur um, in combination. So collectively then, there's a lot of physical, mental, brain health harms associated with these behaviours, and that's something that we have to deal with. Now, those numbers don't even begin to deal with the fact that Around them, there's also problematic use that's not diagnostic. These, you know, people are suffering harm, but it's not at the level of caseness that would be diagnostic, and or they don't present themselves to a clinic. The the more like in the case of gambling, maybe you don't have a gambling disorder, but you have a gambling problem. So the 
people with problem gambling might be 4 to 5 percent. So in each of those cases, if we double the numbers for those harmful, then the numbers go up again. And then if we think of young people, the numbers go up again. And if we think of Australians, typically the numbers go up again. So if you think of cannabis, we're big time users. Gambling, we're the leaders in the world in terms of gambling per capita, eating and so on. So it's no wonder then when uh, Mission Australia does an interview in thousands of young Australians and asks them what's their concern, what's the sort of the big concerns going through their head, it's mental health and alcohol and drug issues. And I have no doubt that when they say mental health, a large part of it is the high prevalence conditions like anxiety and depression, but maybe some of those are also related to the behavioural and substance addictions that are associated with the anxiety and depression as well. And sadly, a lot of the people that actually identify as needing help don't actually engage in help, and if they do, they don't tend to stick to it. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Part of it is perceived stigma. Part of it is just too costly. It's not accessible. There's side effects and so on. So people just don't engage with what's out there. So that's sort of the, the background problem. But I just want to now run you through a few reasons, I think, that we could be doing things differently and where some problems might lie. So if we look at, if we stand back and look at the sort of the visual landscape of what addiction might or compulsions might look like, it's quite varied. It's very varied. It expresses itself in very different ways, as you can see there. And the, the interesting thing, I think, is that, you know, people don't necessarily smoke a cigarette or a joint because they actually like that behaviour. There's, a, there's probably a something under that. There's a relief, there's a, a psychological, physical, not just a physical, but a psychological reason. People don't, you know, um, press buttons or put stacks on top of each other because they like that. that. They don't like to gamble because they, stack, they like stacking chips. There's some other reason there. There's an underlying reason. And so we need to pay a bit more attention to that. Um, three people who gamble might have three very different reasons for doing it or three people who are in different boxes over there might have the same reason for doing what they do. And so we need to be better at understanding those things. And the final thing I'll say on that is if you stop, if you have an alcohol problem and you stop taking alcohol, the underlying problem may not go away. You just stop taking alcohol. You may have either continued to suffer the underlying sort of distress, or you may shift it into something else, another behaviour, which doesn't get picked up. And unfortunately, that's sort of the way things run at the moment in terms of both research and clinically tends to be um, from our diagnostic approach and assessment approaches, uh, you know, people come into either research or, or clinical services, you're assessed for whether you have a uh, an alcohol issue, you go to an alcohol research center or an alcohol treatment, or if you have gambling, that's different. Um, it's very much on the behavioral level that you get sort of triaged. And there's not enough attention on this sort of drivers of what's symptomatic up there. The second problem, I think, is that while our current services and approaches are, are very helpful and everyone's doing the best they can, I think we, we sort of sometimes forget that maybe, particularly for the younger generation, that um, the environments that we, and the way we try to engage them is not necessarily engaging or empowering. It tends to be problem-oriented, it tends to be disempowering and uninspiring in terms of the kind of ways we try to interact with them. And finally, as a, many scientists, I think, in the room, trying to get translate your work you know, the, the statistics say that it takes up to 17 years to, for a finding to hit actual translational value. And getting that work out there is very hard work. And I, I understand why uh, it, it's hard partly because of the system as well. Because if you get a fellowship for three to five years, trying to do translational work is quite hard. It's, it takes longer. It needs more money. Um, it's just you're almost shooting yourself in the foot in terms of academic outcomes if you want to do the translational work. So it, it, it's a hard choice to make if you want to stay in research. 
as, as well as many other you know, systematic things that make it hard to translate things as well. So we need a paradigm shift there as well. In 2013, I moved across to Monash, and at the time, Monash had a, um, a campaign that was, if you don't like it, change it. And that was perfect for me, because I'd done about 20 years of research, was really frustrated at the lack of sort of... Also, I guess when you hit 40 as well, you start to go, what does all this mean? What does my life mean? What's the purpose of all of this? And so combined with personal and professional, when you're asking those questions, and I was sort of unhappy with, yeah, I'd done great in terms of academic outcomes, but I wasn't really able to say I'm, you know, I'm clinically trained, but I wasn't able to shift anything across. So that frustration fitted well with this. And then um, uh, two years after arriving at Monash and really trying to generate this program of interventional research, so I made a shift from more fundamental to interventional research, then... Um, uh, David Winston Turner, who'd passed away the year before, had left a will in the area of uh, compulsions and trying to really drive research capacity. And I was on the fortunate end of receiving some of that. And so I was able to begin a much more longer view on what impactful research could look like and um, sort of totally just ignored the academic outcomes for a while and just started to say, what's the impact I'm looking for? And it was an amazing opportunity. So. With that in mind, we started a, a research program and we also convinced our, uh, our donors that if we were going to really get the, the best value out of the investment they'd done, we needed a purpose-built facility to be able to really... Uh, the problem of translation is, you know, a lot of places that where we want to do interventional work aren't built for science. They're not built in a way to keep and maintain people. And, uh, while being engaging, also rigorous in terms of clinical trials. So we convinced them that we, we needed to build a facility that was going to be inspirational and, and like nothing that existed. So we got, after a long um, sort of battle, we, we found some perfect architects who really design buildings for human experience. Our, our initial experience with university architects was not ideal. Um, after a few months of trying to sort of paint a vision and coming back with very, very stereotypical, boring kind of four walls, we found these guys and they were amazing. So what we wanted was sort of, um, they understood the concepts we wanted to go with. And so then began the, a 12-month process where the, the final product was Brain Park and it it's one of those experiences where what was in our head was exactly translated onto, you know, into the real world, which was just a, a fantastic outcome. So we ended up with, you know, what we really wanted was after running focus groups with people, they, they kept telling us, look, we want nature. We don't want a, a, a dirty sort of coffee table and a reception where it's, it, it's sort of you're the problem and we want a more communal feel and we want light and quality. And so we, we tried to build all that in. So we, we built yoga and meditation studios like you might find in the community. A spin room with an interactive spin room with a, an amazing screen display for <coughs> feedback of how you're going in terms of your physiology and other things as well exercise rooms, consult rooms, virtual reality, um, all of these things you might see in the community, but around it is really hardcore scientific uh, equipment and tools, including some of the best scanners in the world, an exercise physiology room, and so on. So it was quite a unique thing that we've built. So going back to this picture, we wanted to really make sure that when people engage, you know, the picture looks different. The experience is different of being uh, involved in the work that we would carry out in Brain Park. And, and, and I guess when you think of a young person and you present them with options, say, OK, you know, you've got this option or this option, I think you know, I know what they would choose. But we need to build the evidence base here before we can make arguments that it's actually going to help them. I think the other thing is that it's easy to say, let's be solution-oriented and bring science into all of what we do, but it's hard to do unless you have the kind of the facilities and the support that, that we were lucky enough to have. So just describe what, we were, uh, what Brain Park is. It's basically giving people mental experiences and physical experiences across lifestyle and technology capabilities. 
all of which are built around the idea that the brain is plastic and experiences, particularly high-intensity experiences and high-frequency high experiences, do change the brain. And how can we use these to really um, change the brain in a, a good therapeutic way? It's built on so the fact that we know that the habit, we know a lot now about the habit system, the, how it works in the brain, how we can sort of understand it and what changes happen in the brain when things go from habits to addictions. We know the brain, you know, if you've read that book, there's some fascinating stories of the brain that changes itself as a result of experience. Technology is just, you know, we have to utilise and leverage technology in a good way um, and that everything we do does matter. The way we eat, our activities, etc., all of these things matter and so they're foundations really of brain park. And we, 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 are, we ask questions like, how does lifestyle and technology facilitate the cycle in and out of compulsions? How can people measure and monitor their cognitive and brain fitness? That's an important one because you know, unlike your weight or other, you know, blood pressure, etc., it's really hard to measure cognitive, brain, mental fitness. And if you're not measuring it, if you don't have a sort of a concrete indicator of where you're at, you tend to not think about it or want to change it. Um, so it's an important one. How, and how can we make it easier for people to have greater mental and cognitive fitness and brain fitness? Finally, once we learn about these and find out what works for who and why, a lot, the reason we chose all of these is because they are empowering techniques. You know, you put effort in and then you can, you, you can do an 8 to 12 week <coughs> physical or a mental program with us, but then you'll take that away, the learnings and the effects and, uh, for the rest of your life. And it's empowering, you don't have to rely on anyone else. You can, the cost is low and the, hopefully the therapeutic effects are high. They're scalable, again, the cost is low. Even things like virtual reality, the, the consumer market is now more, it's much more affordable now, and I imagine in a few years with the amount of investment that's going on, that it will be available for, you know, as part of any entertainment system. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be absolutely um, everywhere in the coming years. Uh, it's integrated in terms of not just focusing on the mental, but it's physical and mental, and it's a deep dive. You, you, you know, we know exercise is good for us. We know sleep and diet is good for us, but you've got to be able to understand what are the mechanisms and why does it work for some people but not others, um, and that's what we do. We're able to go in with all our tools and really understand it. Having built Brain Park and now had six months to showcase it, the amount of interest and and hunger, anywhere from business to medicine to community to technology. Uh, internationally, there, there is such a, a hunger for the way that the things come, you know, lifestyle and technology can come together for good. It's, um, I'm, I'm sort of inspired to keep going. So I just want to now just talk about some of the specific things that we're doing that we think will be useful going forward in this field. The first thing is, as, as I mentioned to you, that you know, at the moment there's a lot of focus on the external symptoms, the behaviours, and there needs to be a greater focus on the underlying, um, on the underlying drivers of these behaviours, not on the surface symptoms. Well, an analogy might be, if you think of cars, um, and let's say there are several cars over here, and if you open the hood up and look under it, and if you're someone that know, you know, understands cars, there's probably a bunch of, if something goes wrong with these cars, even though they look very different, there's probably a, a core number of structural core elements in a car, you know, foundational things and some functional things that probably is really important to look at and maintain for good car health, if you like. Um, we want to do that. But the analogy, you know, sometimes here, really at a simple level, might be that someone says, okay, let's put all the red cars together and send them to the red mechanic, the guy who deals with red cars. <laughs> let's put all the silver cars together and do the same, and purple, because the purple mechanic will understand that one the best. But it, it's, you know, it's not as simple as that, but it's, it's sort of... It's kind of what we're doing at the moment because all of these services and, and, and research tends to be a little bit like that. 
what we want to do is understand the correlates, the structural and functional correlates, these core <laughs> elements, what drive these behaviours. And so rather than focusing on sort of the diagnostic what, we want to focus on the explanatory power of the, the why. So we might use what we know about the brain and people's cognitive emotional status to rather than group them according to behaviours, we group them according to these foundational core things that drive a lot of our behaviour um, and then put them into research trials. So in here might be a mixture of people who gamble, who do alcohol, etc. Um, but they're driven by a, a core brain or a psychological driver that might be fear for some people, it might be reward, I'm making these up. But then the question is, what, it, what should we be focusing on here? How do we know what to focus on? So what we do is, we, ca we, we can't do everything. We know, we know things like this. If you look back in someone's history, trauma, parenting, you know, th there's a lot of things like that that go on that are often linked with addictions and compulsions. We can't measure all of that, but all of those things also shape the way you react and engage with the world. And so these kind of, when you're presented with a rewarding stimulus or an opportunity in the world, we try to measure that as a current snapshot rather than trying to understand all the trauma and all the, you know, the historical events that led to you being like that. Um, it, we can't do everything, so maybe a psychologist and a psychiatrist might be still working with that level, but we're trying to develop tools that understands how do you engage with the world and how might that explain these behaviours as a snapshot. So I'll explain that a little bit more. So typically research tends to go find your favourite alcohol and compulsive disorder, so people will specialise in these, and then you'll look at what drives that behaviour. You might, you know, if you're into alcohol, if that's your specialty area, you'll select a hundred people with alcohol and then do a bunch of tests to try and understand what cognitive emotional factors might be driving that behaviour. We're going the other way. We're, we're measuring all of these things and all of these things. So we're looking at how these predict a bunch of these behaviours. But why did we pick these ones? Why are they special? Well, um, for over a period of two, three years, what we did is we asked about 70 world experts who are both clinical and neuroscience experts in the area of addiction and compulsion. If they had to put their money on just a core set of drivers that predict risk and relapse and maintenance of addictive compulsive behaviours, what would it be? And we started with about 50 things and we narrowed the consensus down to seven items that everyone agreed would be, you'd put your money on that. So a lot of them are reward, emotion based. Some of them are more cognitive. It's a mixture of things. But it's fine to then know what areas we should be looking at. But what about the tests? Do they exist? Well, the kind of tests that we tend to do uh, in neuropsychology, a lot of them were paper and pencil and they've progressed into sort of tablet-based tests with squares and triangles that tackle uh, your thinking and try to delineate it. A lot of them don't involve reward and emotional. In fact, you try to minimise them. You, don't, you try to exclude a lot of them. Unfortunately, that means you're not tapping into the relevant things that are relevant to a lot of mental health and addictive uh, behaviours and what drives them. So they're not always very useful. The other thing is that these, some of these are very costly. They can be thousands of dollars and they're not targeted at the problem that we're wanting to do and people can't access them. Meanwhile, gaming has developed phenomenally, you know, going from Pong to Space Invaders all the way through to amazingly rich environments and games. What we thought is, okay, so if we're going to engage young people and we're going to get them doing this regularly, as in we want to make it easy to measure their cognitive fitness and how they're tracking emotionally, we have to sort of gamify it, these elements. And so that's, we, we partnered with an industry partner who makes games for Disney and all of those sort of large companies. And we, we developed these tasks that really, while you're playing a game, on the back of it is a very experimental uh, way of doing it where we're getting you to do things and respond to reward and respond to fear and test your how quickly you form habits or how difficult you find it to break habits. 
And so we're testing all of those using this tablet. And the idea is to be able to disseminate that through an app very widely and that we can start to track people's uh, development in these areas because we know they're risk factors or when you develop an addiction, they maintain them. So we have a few people really spearheading that part of our research program. The, the other thing we're doing then is using these scalable, accessible, empowering lifestyle and technology interventions, trying to understand, well, we know exercise is good for us, but ha what part of these does it hit? We, there's good evidence that exercise changes dopamine, which changes reward, or it reduces stress, um, but we don't quite know how to target specific things. And that's our, what we're going to do is look at all of these interventions and various ways of, you know, meditation is many things. Exercise is many things. It's not one thing. And you can look at those many things and then try and target these things. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that. And Rebecca's really driving that part of our interventions research program. And what she'll do is develop these intervention programs look at broad things like this, quality of life, mental health and well-being, how these are changing physiological and brain things, but also how they're changing this. And our, our idea is that if we can use these to improve these areas, these will improve anyway. People will be pretty resourceful. And um, if you're helping with the core sort of drivers of many behaviour, that these will improve as, an, as a byproduct of that. So... Just to explore a little bit more this area of lifestyle interventions, um, exercise intervention. If you take a if you take a cross-sectional snapshot of students in a university population and look at their uh, anxiety and stress levels as a function of how engaged they are in exercise, how active they are, you, you'll see a very strong correlation that the more active someone is, that the less mental health burden there is. That doesn't mean exercise you know, fixes mental health, it's just an association, but it's a powerful one. And recently there was a, a study in Lancet Psychiatry of 1.2 million people, so massive study, where they found again that compared to people who don't exercise, those who do exercise have a much reduced level of mental health burden on a month-to-month -month basis. And it seemed that the kind of exercises that really helped were those ones that were more team-oriented or ones where you were a bit more mindful. So rather than just walking, you were, you were doing things that required a bit more thinking as well as physical. Um, so that was interesting and uh, very strong results that support that exercise is a good thing. Inactivity leads to a bunch of things. You don't even have to, you know, we kind of know all of this in the back of our head that inactivity causes a lot of problems. On the flip side, activity can be enhancing in many areas. The problem for us is a lot of this evidence, whether it's uh, linked to inflammation or brain or cognition, etc., a lot of it comes from animal studies in idealistic controlled circumstances and doesn't always translate to human studies. Um, so what we're doing, really, now that we've got the Brain Park facility, is to be able to run these studies uh, and look at how does exercise, if we change its intensity, its frequency, its duration, how do we hit stress and anxiety or decision making or brain health? Each of these are different outcomes and the mixture of these we, we think will lead to different outcomes here. For example, high intensity interval training it, where you really get the lactate system turning over seems to be more beneficial for brain health, but it does cause a bit of stress, whereas low intensity activity is better for stress, and, but not for your brain health. And so depending on what outcome you want, we might be able to target a particular exercise prescription. But that's not all. Um, we know that generally exercise opens the brain up, makes it a bit more plastic and malleable to, to new experiences. So it, it, Imagine, you know, if you're doing a, any kind of intervention, psychological intervention or taking medication, etc., it seems that if you do exercise, you, are, you, you might be more likely to benefit from that treatment because exercise is just opening up the brain circuits and loosening up and 
getting good uses and enabling a bit of change to happen that doesn't happen in the absence of exercise. But what we think we can do is maybe combine lifestyle and technology for even greater effect. So maybe combining exercise with uh, mindfulness and even a third technology. So imagine someone who has a gambling problem. They might, what we might do is get them to exercise and then use virtual reality to put them, put them in a virtual casino where they're experiencing the urges and the, the problems that they deal with and then get them, them to exercise their mindfulness techniques to surf those urges and exercise has a beneficial effect to really maximize that ability. Now it's a big ask, we might not be able to get one individual to commit to all of those things but it's also possible that within an hour you could do some really clever things where you could do all of that. I think for people who are on medication, maybe they can uh, take on these you know, novel assessments and interventions in the hope of reducing their medication, maybe even coming off. I mean, for some people, clearly it's, it's necessary and you're not going to fix all the problems. I think the important thing is to just give people another option, one that they will engage with if it's not the current treatments, or one that they can engage with if it's not accessible or um, if it's not, you know, too costly for them or just accessible in terms of geographic. In, in, in a preventative way, I think there's a lot of hope that if schools and businesses and you know can get on board with not having the intense craziness that currently exists but having these timeouts as part of work or around work where we do understand how you can do the physical uh, do the one hour of something that's good for you physically mentally socially etc as a real preventative for lots of these bad outcomes happening so I, I think there's a lot of hope there and people are recognizing that that's more and more necessary and it actually gets the best out of their employees or their students and so on. So if we take the concept of gambling a little bit further we know that for most people gambling is not a problem but as you develop and it gets more severe then there are these machine features that typically don't mean anything to most of us. The sounds, uh, the, the design features like um, could be a near miss. I don't know if some of you are familiar with these features, but for most punters it doesn't make any difference, those things. But as you become more and more problematic gambler, they really start to, you hear them more, you see them more, they affect you more. Uh, because we have vulnerabilities, we have cognitive biases, we have brain systems that are geared to developing habits and these features tend to push you toward habits. And the reason I say all of that is because these are machine environmental effects, these are individual effects and it's really hard to do science where you can understand individual environment machine interactions. If you try to really do this in a lab and get a lot of internal validity, you sacrifice external validity. You don't get a good environmental feel, it's not, it doesn't feel ecological, and you can't send someone into a casino strapped with all scientific equipment, so you can't, you can't win. And that's where virtual reality is a real um, amazing technology because it, it really does feel real, it's engaging and it's safe, and you can send some. you're measuring and controlling everything. So let's take that a bit further. So this is maybe a, a typical scene and what we see is that we, if we split up the agent, the, the machine, with the environment, your friends and the sounds and smells, with the, the, the individual, what we're doing, and this is Adrian Carter, he heads our neuroscience and ethics and society part of the program, is we're looking at, first of all, putting the individual into a, a virtual casino so that they really start to get into those emotional zones that drive their behavior. Then what we can do, and these are snapshots from our virtual casino, is we can look at their behavior. We can see if these policy regulation posters, they could be pro or anti, you know, uh, what are you gambling with? How much have you lost? There's always these government sort of things, or there's advertisements for pro gambling. We could look at the effect of those on gambling. Um, these are some examples. Or we could look at pop-ups that come up, information that pops up on the screen and whether they're actually helpful or not. 
So just to give you an example of one, so again, this is a snapshot from our virtual casino. The sound is off on this one, um, but so in the virtual casino, this person's playing. In this condition, so they won. And then in the next condition, they'll get a miss here. So that's a near miss. Uh, sorry, that's a win. That is, I can't see it from this angle, but that's the near miss where the strawberry was just one off. Um, and that's a full miss, so that the strawberry was not in the picture. What we know from science is that this condition is actually more frustrating than this condition, and it's more motivating for you to stay and continue to play. So it's, one, it's more frustrating and it's more motivating. So if you're clever and you put a certain number of these in, you might maintain the person staying there longer. But it's hard to test in a, when it's, you're doing it in a lab. So this is what the actual, just quickly, this is what our, this is our virtual reality setup. So we hooked them up where we're measuring a lot of physiological responses. It's all wireless, so you, you can move around in the environment. We set up how we want the environment to feel in terms of the number of bar staff or etc. We're measuring heart rate, respiration, skin conductance. <coughs> got a, a bar and then a the electronic gaming area and a sports a sports betting area we haven't exploited this area yet, yet to do some sports betting studies but what we have done is electronic gaming machines you can pick any machine you sit down and then you start playing So gaming, so the person's just moved to another machine, which is fine. Get the idea. Gambling, like a lot of addictions, it's a very emotional experience. And so when you put the, the goggles on the VR set, you forget about the equipment and you're transported to a, a, a casino and then all the emotions and stuff start running. And that's what we want to measure and that's what we want to work with in real time. So you could imagine then someone is sitting next to a therapist or a researcher and side by side in real time you're working with these reactions, whether you're responding to reward, etc. can be quite predictive of outcomes and quite therapeutic. So we also know with gambling that um, exposure therapy can be helpful. Our colleagues in Adelaide have shown that after six months just exposing people and then talking to them about you know, how they're feeling, what's happening to them, why they're doing what they're doing, it can be really valuable. Part of the issue with exposure therapy, though, is you can't see that, but those highlighted bits across the different sessions of exposure therapy, that's imaginal work. So you're imagining you're somewhere and then try to muster up those emotions. Imagine you're doing this, imagine you're doing that. It's really hard to do. It's quite an intellectual exercise. But with virtual reality, you, do, you don't have to imagine. You're just there. It's happening. And it's a very different feel to this. So we think we can really um, help this kind of therapeutic world, which is done in an imaginal, intellectual way, by uh, actually having virtual reality support for exposure therapy. And in fact, if we just switch over to from gambling to obsessive compulsive disorder, where Exposure therapy uh, is actually one of the biggest, most effective uh, therapies together with medications. We're trialling virtual exposure therapy now um, in a clinic, the Melbourne Clinic, which is one of Australia's biggest clinics for obsessive compulsive disorder. We've sort of hijacked one of their rooms and we've built our virtual reality studio. And um, at the moment, there's a lot of challenges to these treatments. The compliance is low, it's very time-consuming, costly, etc. And also, those intrusive thoughts are really hard to generate, again, if you're just imagining things sitting in an office. But this is our... I'll just first show you our virtual reality OCD setup. 
So again, they're hooked up. There's a lot of physiological measurement. This is our kitchen scene. It's very interactive. What we do is we give the person tasks. So they'll get a mobile phone and the mobile phone will buzz and they'll have an instruction. You know, put the uh, soup in the microwave or take this out of the fridge or chop this up. And people with obsessive compulsive disorder, they even hate touching switches. It, makes, it creates a lot of anxiety for them. And so in this virtual world, it's a safe world, but it still feels realistic. Um, this bathroom is built on a bathroom that is essentially identical to the one in the Melbourne Clinic. So we're comparing virtual to physical um, experiences and therapeutics in the Melbourne Clinic. So okay, and what we can do is ramp up that, you know, as I said, we give them tasks from simple through to more and more difficult. And this is what happens in the clinic too. And so now we're comparing virtual to tr traditional in the Melbourne clinic to see if we can make this work. If we can, the cost comes down, access goes up. You could start, imagine these systems, you could download at home and start doing things. And it could be a closed circuit where depending on your physiological reactions to exposure, you could automatically start ramping it up or down or do it yourself. And so it opens up a whole new world we also, because we're scientists and we like to pick things apart, we can look at different stages of that exposure. So when the instruction comes up, the anxiety, is that the most relevant thing? Or when the fear of seeing the object of what you have to engage with or touch? Or is it the actual point of contact where the disgust happens? Breaking these up and understanding the reactions um, and then targeting the intervention to those particular parts might actually be a much more useful way to go than just asking people how they feel in imaginal situations. Now, we interviewed 81 of the staff at the Melbourne Clinic and uh, also got them to engage with virtual reality and we asked them a bunch of questions. It's, now, for us, it's no good having an amazing technology that seems useful, but the clinicians aren't going to take it up. They're just not interested. They don't think it's going to work. They have reservations for whatever reason. Only a third of them had tried before we let them try it. But once they tried, they were very positive. They, they thought it was acceptable to use in the clinic and that it would be appropriate, even though they had a limited understanding. They, you know, these, for us, were very positive. They had some concerns over feasibility. But a lot of that was perceived feasibility. It's too costly, it's too technically difficult to set up and so on. And it is for someone that doesn't know how to do that, but we help them. We could, we, we've already done it in their lab and it's, it's actually more of a perceived feasibility issue than not. So just to summarise what I've shown you, because I've shown you a lot of sort of different areas and just to bring it together, where I showed you that we're taking a different approach. So we're trying to really develop assessment tools and approaches that look at the underlying drivers of a multitude of behaviours that look very different on the surface, but we think have shared drivers underneath. We, we're not only looking at the underlying drivers in the person, but in the context of, say, the gambling, we're trying to understand the drivers in terms of the environment versus the agent, the machine versus the individual and those complex interactions there which we can do. And that's a, another approach difference that we think is quite novel. In terms of detection, those seven things that we came to a, you know, an international consensus on, we're developing gamified tools and tasks that we can widely and cheaply distribute widely, uh, sorry, internationally, so that people can really measure, monitor these risk and resilience factors. Measuring things easily for people, like the scales on a, you know, when you, um, on the weight scales, you need little triggers there to be able to measure, monitor, and yeah, just trigger you into thinking about that thing that you should be doing. And in an ideal world, if we have the measures and the interventions, and they're all easily accessible, and non-stigmatizing and empowering and you know what outcome you're going for, then you can target an intervention to a particular um, mental brain fitness 
outcome that you're looking for. So hopefully sometime in the future, that's the kind of prescriptions and strategies we'll be able to adopt. We're also doing detection in context. So we know that features like that near miss effect that I showed you can be quite predictive of severity of a gambling disorder or a prediction of relapse. And so we can do some of those tests or assessments in, in what seems like a real world in context as well as more broadly like a more personality, cognitive, in context independent way. In terms of treatment, well, I've showed you that with virtual reality we, we're doing exposure therapy in OCD and soon in gambling, um, so that's quite novel. And then I also talked about how we're really interested in combining, cleverly combining lifestyle and technology so that rather than going to the gym for an hour and just doing physical for physical outcomes, you might go to the gym for an hour but do a combination of things to get a physical and a mental outcome that you want in the future. So that, that's what we'd be aiming for. And then a lot of what we do we think is sort of engaging and you know, empowering and just the whole experience is quite a different experience to uh, a more communal, coactive uh, kind of uh, design and hopefully inspiring people to, to sort of great uh, greater outcomes in a broad sense. There's principles of behaviour change that we're really trying to specialise in for so that these behaviours do actually last and endure. There's principles about how you know habits and motivations work. Motivation gets you going but it doesn't sustain you and so how do you manipulate habits in a way to make sure it's not a decision every time to be you know effortful I have to exercise but you just make it a part of what you do by being clever around how you stack habits together or how you put triggers in there to make sure people do it and all the way to the beginning where you do motivational interviewing to make sure people understand why people why this is even good for them what is their understanding how does it help or hinder their life and you know, creating a bit of a dissonance early on, an understanding of, well, um, yeah, I should engage in this because this is what I want, this is where I am, and there's a conflict there, and this exercise might help me resolve that conflict because there's an outcome that I'm looking for. We're really aiming to be an external facing lab. So it's a really conscious decision where a lot of our outcomes, I'm really conscious not to leave it in the academic or even just the clinical, but we now partner with community partners, so a lot of our exercise stuff can go straight out into the community through particularly things like the YMCA, which have an international network. Um, we're looking at the ethics and policy and commercial technology applications to really speed and scale all of this up. Just like to thank all of our supporters and um, particularly the David Winston Turner Endowment Fund, which really made all of this happen, and the professional staff that make Brain Park work, and Rebecca, who's my co-director, that really, she's an enormous support for all of this. So thank you for listening. None of this would have been possible if it wasn't for the philanthropic gift of the David Winston Endowment Fund. Um, that has really enabled us to go for a much longer term impactful vision and there's something about philanthropy when someone digs into their pocket and gives you money versus getting it through the usual sort of fellowship academic themes that makes you much more accountable and responsible and drive you to um, meaningful outcomes and I think it's really I just want to note that and um, it's been very valuable to have that support and obviously Monash University has also come on board. So, We're going to have some questions in a moment but I would use my newly elected president's prerogative to ask the first question. Um, I come from a background of working in the not-for-profit sector in fundraising, not-for-profit leadership and management, so I'm particularly interested um, how the relationship started with the David Winston Turner Fund and how that has continued. Mm. So David Winston Turner was someone who, I, he was a stockbroker himself, a Monash alumnus who made uh, a substantial sort of money, I guess, on the stock market. When he passed away, he realised that, um, I think through his own experiences, that he, 
there wasn't a lot of research happening in the area of compulsions, and he really wanted to grow that capacity, so he left his will. Um, and we got engaged because the, the trust had approached the university, and when they first approached the university, there wasn't the right people or the program, and when I got there, they really saw a... Uh, a partnership to really be able to grow this area. We we meet with them. We we really involve them as as regularly as we can that they want to. Um, we've subsequently had another foundation, the Wilson Foundation, really find us and become a supporter as well. And they're very different. They they really want to be hands on in terms of the science and want to know everything that's going on. Whereas with the David Winston Turner, they're much more big picture and don't really want to necessarily be involved in every part. Um, so it's very different how we maintain those relationships. Just before we have the first question, can I say, for those of you who are seeking grants from the philanthropic sector, you got a lot of really useful information there. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, think about it and follow the direction advice you were given. Net first question, please. Sandra. Uh, that's really terrific work, Murat. Um, I suppose what, we, what you would want is to see that this is effective in the long term. Uh, you probably haven't been trying this long enough yet to know that it is successful long term. Um, in, in any particular in any, area? Well, or any, I, any, anything that you've tried. Yeah, no, not, not enough mm -hmm. because um, Brain Park is six months old. Some of the studies have been going on for, let's say, two years or so, three years. But kind of clinical trials that we're running, they take three, four years, as you, you know, as many of you in the room would know, and the outcomes are going to take a bit of time. But I'm optimistic um, that a lot of these things are sort of designed for the long term. Um, you know, the idea is to build habits and behaviour change in people along that path so that they are sustainable. So we hope, yeah. Thanks very much for a great presentation. I really enjoyed that. Um, I'm uh, really interested in the use of gaming in, um, in what you're doing there, but there's also, I think, a deep irony in that because um, I think it's emerging as a point of addiction, for, particularly for a lot of young people, and I think anyone with uh, teenagers on their hands would be um, nodding furiously at this point. Um, is, there, um, is there a component of this study which is actually looking at um, compulsive um, behaviours around gaming, and is that going to actually uh, create a problem for you because of the, um, the, uh, the treatment? Yeah, mode that you've created. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. Um, two things to say. I think clearly there are harmful uses of technology. That's not going to go away. It's, it's, you know, technology is more and more a way we interact with the world, as is our lifestyle habits. And part of the conscious reason for choosing those is because that is how we engage with the world, our, our habits and our technology. So we have to work out how to use them sort of in good ways. And a lot of people who play games, um, there is the bad, you know, for, for a lot of people it takes too much time, but there's actually, it's actually also a very rich environment where you can do a lot of risk taking, decision making, there's a social element, there's, you know, uh, and studies that are looking at this, you also have enhancement effects. So we, we can't forget there's also a good side to it, that we don't use it in that way, and kids don't use it in that way. Um, the other thing is we're actually now partnering with a, a, a professional gaming company who play League of Legends, not a company, a, a team. They're athletes. Uh, they compete every Friday. They go to Sydney. And the whole area of, I mean, they're gaming every day of the week, but they're athletes. And where's that boundary between their, is it an addiction? How is their mental health? Because they're not being very physical. And so we're coming into that space to work with them to try and, start understanding which part is good and which part and for who it's actually a problem and um, but it's very early yeah it's not going to go away though <laughs> thank you um, you mentioned several times underlying causes of addiction or underlying factors um, and I can see how you're approaching this this quite differently um, but I wonder what hope you hold out that you will be able to use the work you're doing also as a pathway to diagnose and treat 
the underlying causes. I, I understand what you're doing with exposure therapy, but it's not appropriate for every condition. Yes. Um, there are other therapies available, particularly for traumatic memories. Yes. Um, and I, I just wonder, you mentioned trauma earlier on, how many of that underlies a lot of these conditions? And, and if that were approached and fixed as part of this, uh, how much more beneficial it might be? Yeah, um, I'll just try and... So I guess um, what, what, what I was trying to... People will continue to work with, you know, trauma or those kind of histories in the current, in the current system. So we're not trying to replace that. I think what we're saying is that those traumas would have shaped the way people work here. And, for example, we know with um, particular forms of cognitive or brain training or mindfulness that we can target those things, or even brain stimulation, we can target those cognitive affective things that are a byproduct of that trauma to try and shift it in that way rather than go back to the trauma, if you like. So you just you think using the plasticity of the brain can achieve uh, an effective result that could be similar? I think so. And, and there's a study, for example, just to give you an example, um, there was a, uh, in 2012 a study published by the uh, New Zealand group where they followed people for 30 years in, I think it was Dunedin, um, from age 12 to 32. And at, when they were 12, what they did is they looked at really quite simple measures of the idea of um, control. So things like uh, attention selection res and response inhibition, those two things. They said, how much... How much of these two does the student have? They asked the teacher, they asked the parent, and they did a really quick test of it, a really crude test. 30 years later, those tests had really huge prediction on financial status, divorce status, criminality, uh, substance use, mental health issues. You know what I mean? Like all of those things. So that's the kind of approach that I think we could offer that complements the current existing Peter. Well, I was going to say, is, is, is golf a uh, feature? Yeah, look, at exercise, often people talk about, uh, you know, is that an addiction because people, um, or, uh, you know, there's lots of areas where it's under debate. And, I mean, I, I personally don't think golf is unless it's causing you harm. Um, <laughs> it may be with your, if you're always there. <laughs> But the boundaries with a lot of these things are, are not clear. Um, I imagine for, you know, uh, for example, the internet uh, and gaming, the World Health Organization recently recognized gaming as a, uh, an addiction. But that also has a lot of, a lot of people also disagreed because for a lot of people it's not an addiction. And um, it's really hard to sort of be clear about the definitions coffee, nicotine, etc. We don't want to be pathologizing things unless there's a, a clear process that underlies them that typically, you know, in my mind is more of a psychological as well as a physiological that is really um, problematic, not just because, you know, you're sp spending time playing golf is not a problem. It's why is that happening regularly that we need to... Okay, look. with the questions, we're going to go this section, that section, <laughs> this section, and finish with... Andy. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Therese Mitchell. Um, at the moment, there's actually a Royal Commission into Mental Health that's happening around Victoria. Um, we've got it coming to Gippsland um, on the 22nd of May, so I'm part of that um, stakeholder engagement. Uh, so it's looking, um, I suppose, what's happening on the ground um, and trying to get um, some, I suppose, data and, and, and how it's affecting communities. Um, I suppose what I want to know is how are you relating to the environmental effects like um, the debt of Australia and financial um, effects. Uh, also, um, there's homelessness, there's a lot of older women now that have been affected by that and the stresses and everything that's... and there's a lot of rise in mental health in that area. 
Uh, and I suppose it's also the shift is around um, youth unemployment and what's happening to that. So are you using that data to actually um, as part of that research as well? Not directly. I mean, I think you make a lot of good points about these more life environmental things. Um, I mean, in the context of we're trying to have some influence, in, like for example with gambling, the distribution of uh, pokies really is a big problem in the way that it invites problems to do with addiction. And we would like to use our findings in some of these virtual reality, the way the, the machines operate and so on, to, to educate and change policy and the way that those things are distributed and some of the features in there. Uh, that broadly is environmental. But when you talk about homelessness and debt and financial problems, I'm actually giving a talk uh, a couple of weeks later at the Financial Counselling Australia conference because addiction is very obviously a common problem there um, and they're interested in these things. And these, because they're low cost, high access, low stigma kind of interventions, if they work, I think at least gives people a bit more resilience and, and sort of buffer to not get into those conditions and that's the way I would view them rather than expensive, sort of inaccessible type treatments. Jane in the last row. Um, Murat, thank you very much for taking what seems to be a really new approach to these sorts of problems. Um, it's been a very insightful presentation. As a clinician, the phenomenon that we've been dealing with increasingly over the last couple of decades is the issue of dual disability or multiple disability in these areas. So you have problems with alcohol, other drugs and gambling, etc. So you layer these problems. Um, it will be interesting because I realise you're almost at proof of concept stage at the moment, as so you focus on a single disability um, in exploring the effectiveness of the proposed treatments. But it will be interesting in time when you start to deal with actually the broader population who do in fact suffer from multiple disabilities in this area, looking at um, effectiveness for that population. Um, obviously the whys for the population are actually the same, it just has multiple manifestations. So it's the Hydra effect. Um, whether or not the interventions are as powerful or need to be supplemented in some way. So I'll be watching the outcomes of this work with great eagerness because it looks so promising. Any comments on multiple disability in this area. Yeah, I mean, that, that's I think one of the strengths, if it, if it does work, that the sort of approach lends itself to co comorbid approaches and also not missing someone shifting from a, you know, an alcohol problem to a gambling to something else and, you know, at the moment it probably gets missed. We um, recently, one of our studies where we're combining exercise and mindfulness and we're taking in basically any of any of those on the left hand side. We had to shut the study down after a couple of weeks of advertisement because there was so much interest in being part of this. And so we're sort of halfway through that study and we're blind so we don't quite, well single blind, um, we don't know quite what's happening but just at the level of engagement of when you broaden the network and you don't label it as addiction you label it as, are you struggling with these behaviours or these kind of, uh, it's less of a label kind of approach, it's a broader, uh, the level of engagement we've had is amazing and I think that's already a win in terms of just engaging people in research and talking about it and, and so that's what I can say but I, I do agree which it's still relatively uh, proof of concept. Okay, we're coming slowly down the front, anyone <coughs> in the section here? Yes, there. Golf has already been mentioned. I've, I've been involved with sailing virtually all my life, teaching many, many young people to sail. Um, sailing involves physical activity. It's a mentally based thing and so forth. I've, we've never seen any young person involved with sailing have any involvement with or serious problems with drugs, alcohol and so on. This seems to be the preventative side, the other side to what, what you're talking about. Any comment? 
I, I mean, I think that's what I'm supporting and suggesting, that these, um, these, just the fact that there's a social element, I think, is probably protective. You know, the fact that there's uh, the stuff I was talking about in terms of someone who's physically and mentally active and got a social connection, etc. that's good for your brain health, your cognitive health. It's a resilience increase. Um, I think that there are some, there's a pretty incredible study, uh, it was in Iceland, they had huge problems with alcohol and drugs there. It was bigger than um, a lot of countries. And they did a, um, they changed the community structure. One of the bad things, they sort of brought a curfew in, they were quite strict in the way community worked, but the thing they really invested in was making it cheap or free for the community to engage in whether it's sailing or gymnastics or this or that, all of those kind of community things that um, engage you physically and mentally in things. And there was, over a 10-year period, a, a massive drop-off in the level of alcohol and drug use because people were more social, physical, mental, etc. Um, there's a guy called Milkman who did sort of looked across those studies, if you're interested in that study. I uh, can't remember his first name, but Milkman Iceland. It's incredible. But it, I think it goes to show if it's done systematically and there's a real investment in it, that it can be quite protective. Okay, we'll start on the second side. Coming down. Oops, sorry. Yeah. One more, then we're going to quickly go down, finish with Andy. Hi there. I was just wondering, Murat, um, with sort of obsessive based addictions, how do you see religious fundamentalism or terrorism? As a Sorry, form, do you see re religious fundamentalism or terrorism as a form of addiction? <laughs> I'd have to think about that one. <laughs> I mean, religiosity is a, a common feature, isn't it, of um, OCD? But I, ha I haven't. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, starting at the back on the right-hand side for me. You one down there. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I'm still currently an undergraduate student, so I, I'm not entirely familiar with um, the clinical um, interventions that are currently used to address the whys. Um, so just to clarify, these interventions, um, I guess, are... A, um, do not require addressing the, you know, the problem itself in a therapeutic one-on-one -on -one clinical setting, um, but they're utilizing these tools um, and, and engaging the person socially to, um, to address the what's, is that correct? Yeah, it's a good question. At the moment, the, the way we're set up is we're still a research clinic. So the studies that we run are still studies that we have to get funded, whether it's through government bodies, etc. And so then we have a certain structure to those studies. You know, there's an active group, a control group, um, and so on. And so then people that are eligible for those studies will come in and, and whatever the study combination is, they'll do those in a standard way. But the idea is going down the line as we build up the evidence that where clinics are coming in and it's more of a drop-in drop centre for that so as an individual you can then come in but we're not there yet um, we, we we've got a few years of work to do i think to as these as our trials are coming as the results are coming out and we can say this works or this doesn't then yeah the evolution is to just um, have more of a drop-in type center thank you okay rob and then andy yeah i'm I'm impressed by all of this. I think it was a fantastic approach and really interesting. I'm um, surprised, though, that you aren't using talking therapy as one of these things. I mean, it seems to me that talking therapy is a well-established way of looking at what's happening and helping people to, to do it. It's obviously something that engages them mentally and teaches them new ways of thinking. Why is it not there? Um, 
simply, I agree with you, it's simply because we're still a, in a research lab component, so sort of driving the research elements that are novel. We know the talk therapies work. Once we know which parts of this work, we're already, I mean, we have a psychology clinic that sees a lot of, um, I mean, to give you an example, we're already working in the context of PTSD with our psychology clinic who deals with police force who are seeing traumatic things where we're applying the virtual reality already into that you know early phases but we're doing it um, and that will happen more and more but it's only because you know we have to do certain things well and we can't do everything well um, and they're already you mean that the might be I agree with you but they're already established these are not established once these are established we join sort of augment them together and I think that's the that's the ultimate. Andy, last but not least. It's better be good, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so I guess it's a couple it's a question in a couple of parts. Um, I'm kind of fascinated by what you're doing, particularly in the VR space, because as a father, I'm seeing, you know, my son sitting down on games for half of his life and and watching uh, the game producers be more and more inventive in the way that they drive addiction in, in the, the modality of the experience that they're creating. Um, and I'm just wondering, is this, when you talk about habit forming, okay, tr traditionally habit forming, we talk about a period of time over which you need to form, form a habit. Um, is the use of VR and therefore the kind of exclusion of the physical side and limitations that that imposes around the amount of time it takes to do anything or to train somebody, would that result in the ability to accelerate the habit forming? And is that something that we're seeing in game creation and game adoption and addiction? And, or is it quite the opposite, where that habit, habit forming is actually also dependent on the physical stimuli and therefore a VR experience slows it down? I, I don't think the physical... I mean, the first thing to say is I think the organisations and companies are becoming you know, better and better at understanding the neuroscience and making it easier and easier for you to engage in the technology to then develop a habit and an investment that then keeps you going. And so it's challenging our habit-breaking sort of internal abilities more and more. I think um, uh, I also have four kids, of which are between 16 and 23, and similarly share that kind of... Um, online experience quite a lot and I think it's very easy for them to it's just so easy to engage and be rewarded now um, which is the beginning of a habit formation and I think there's a real challenge there that is for the kids now that probably wasn't there before and so we've got to be aware of that in terms of the, the you know I'm not sure that you need a physical element to have a habit formation because there's not a lot of if you think of gambling at the pokies it's not a lot of physical there's a lot of visual uh, perceptual um, a lot of intrinsic actually in terms of forming that habit and conditioning so I'm not sure that VR is good or bad in in that way maybe I didn't understand the question so, so if that's the case is there, an, is there an ability is there evidence that shows that you can use VR or even just gaming as an effective mechanism to accelerate the adoption of new habits as a, as a therapy? I think any time where you can shift emotion and repetitively do it, you can develop a habit. And I think the fact that VR is something where you can induce an emotion and do things rap repeatedly, and not only that, now you've got the ability to you're measuring everything they're doing and you can feed back and adjust the environment whether it's uh, a level of difficulty or mastery or um, in a space that you've embodied. There is a bit of physical as well actually but the fact that it's a continuous closed loop that you can do that I think has a massive potential to induce habits, good or bad, but we're not there. We're still in the early parts of that. I think it's already happened in you know, whether it's Facebook or Snapchat or there, there's so many little things in there that induce habits. We're only starting with virtual reality, but it's probably got a greater harm potential and a greater 
positive potential because of the fact that you're emotionally invested in the space and you embody it. Thank you very much. I have invited Professor Sandra Rees, who is just inducted as a Fellow of the Royal Society of Victoria, to move a vote of thanks to our speaker. Oh, you're a hard task, <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to sit there and enjoy it, but I did enjoy it. I enjoyed it very much indeed, and as one neuroscientist to another, another man who's found working on the brain absolutely fascinating. Uh, thank you very much. It's been wonderful to hear about Brain Park. I must admit I'd never heard about it before and we all know a lot more about it now. It was wonderful that Win Brian Winston Turner gave, had, uh, David, sorry, had the um, insight to give you the money, um, and it was wonderful that you and your colleagues were able to put together this totally new concept. I think that's fantastic. You found the right architects, you put it all together, and that's really wonderful. I think changing people's behaviour is probably one of the hardest things we can ever do in the population and uh, and having a long-term change to what in what you're doing is obviously incredibly important and keeping our brain in order is what we all want to do in all our life so congratulations I think that's wonderful and a good luck in all, all your endeavors thank you very much for speaking to us Thank you very much, Sandra and Murat. Thank you very much. If I can just finish by saying, I'm glad you went to the school that you did and that you repeated HSC to VCE. And then when you filled out your form and your ninth or 10th priority, you didn't really know what it was. And then in your third year, you had an aha moment. Um, we and many other people are the beneficiaries of that trajectory of your educational journey. Thank you ever so much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.